Wait, how does this work? You just press the button. This one? No, not that one. <laughs> You're listening to Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. Everything seems impossible to what happens. Everyone would be affected by a nuclear war. Our government is planning to spend trillions of dollars to develop new nuclear weapons that we don't need. You can't win a nuclear war. We are all experts on nuclear weapons because we are all going to be affected by those nuclear weapons. And here are your hosts, Joe Cirincioni and Michelle Dover. Welcome back to a not-so-happy new year. This is Joe Cirincioni, president of Plowshares Fund. And I'm Michelle Dover, director of programs. We have a special episode today. We're going to take a deep dive into the crisis with Iran, which is potentially the most serious foreign policy challenge facing certainly this administration, but perhaps the United States in the last 40 years. We're going to start early warning by helping you find the signal in this noise. The news came in fast and furious over the weekend, so there's a really a lot to cover. We've invited in Dr. Aryan Tabatabai, one of the top Iran experts yes. in the nation, to help us find this out. Um, she'll be joined, and she just actually had an article published in the New York Times. A it terrific was piece. Really fantastic. She'll join Dr. John Carl Baker, who will also talk to us about North Korea. The other crisis. And then we're going to turn to an interview with Stephen Miles. He's the executive director of Win Without War, which is a diverse network of activists and organizations working for a more peaceful and progressive U.S. foreign policy. They sit at the hub of some of the key activist groups trying to turn this country away from war and towards diplomacy, towards sanity. We're hoping to use these two segments to pair that analysis with that action so that you leave this podcast with a better understanding of the magnitude of the crisis we're facing and what you can do about it. If you're familiar with Plowshares Fund, you know that for years we've been working to stop a war with Iran. Some people consider us Cassandras, always warning about things that don't happen. But remember, the curse of Cassandra mm -hmm. was that nobody believed her, not that she was wrong. We've been right about this. We've been right about the dangers, right about the war. We've been right about the solutions to try to prevent this war. I personally think that war with Iran is almost inevitable, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying to stop it, to mitigate the damage, to bring it to an early end should it start. And for once, please learn the lessons, learn what happened, why we got into this war, what policies put us on this path. As always, if you like what you hear, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share. This type of feedback is how we know that what we're providing is useful and interesting to you. And we need more than ever to get the news out. So please, if you like this, share this with your friends. But enough from us. The clock is ticking. Let's go. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Today I'm joined by two experts who you have met before, Dr. John Carl Baker, Senior Program Officer here at Plowshares Fund, and Dr. Aryan Tavatabai, Associate Political Scientist at Rand Corporation. Thank you so much for coming in on what is a very busy start to our new year. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We all know what today's news is going to cover. The question is, will we be able to do it in seven minutes? Our time starts now. Ariane, by now most of our listeners have probably heard about the event on Thursday night that has brought us to the brink of war. The United States killed General Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force in Iran, as he stepped off a plane in Iraq. The administration is putting this as the spark, but in reality this has been a long time coming. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that path has been? Yeah, so President Trump on the campaign trail had vowed to leave the Iran nuclear deal uh, and to try to get a better deal um, to replace it. And then after a year and a half, he withdrew the United States from the deal in May 2018 and started what it called what the administration calls the maximum pressure campaign, uh, which has really been a policy based around sanctions and pressure. Uh, Iran started to retaliate in May 2019, uh, and it did so on two fronts. 
against the nuclear file, uh, and we've talked about this before, and then also taking kinetic uh, action in the region. Uh, all of that sort of escalated uh, and brewed over uh, throughout 2019 and got us to the point where we are today. You had you had an article in the New York Times today that you wrote with Philip Gordon, a colleague, in which you say a genuine policy of de-escalation would require facing the reality that the maximum pressure campaign has failed. That campaign was designed to curb Iranian violent behavior in the region and stop its nuclear program. The tragic irony is that it now seems set to do the opposite. So, yeah, um, President Trump was hoping that by pulling out of the deal and starting the maximum pressure campaign, uh, Iran would change its behavior in 12 points and 12 areas that were laid out by Secretary Pompeo in his 12 points. Uh, and that encompasses Iran's nuclear program, missile program, and regional activities. In reality, what we've seen is kind of the opposite. Iran has doubled down on a lot of those activities. Um, it has actually uh, been targeting U.S. interests, U.S. partners in the region a lot more than it was in the past. And on the nuclear file, well, we had this announcement over the weekend uh, on Sunday that Iran would be taking the fifth and final step to dial down its implementation of the nuclear deal. Um, Iran started to take these steps on the nuclear file, uh, pushing the limits of uh, the JCPOA uh, because the United States had pulled out of the deal. So now we face a situation in which we are escalating in the region. We are very likely going to have some sort of response from Iran. And uh, all of this is happening while Iran is no longer bound. Uh, it doesn't consider itself bound by some of the key restrictions that the nuclear deal had imposed. And, you know, we were talking before the podcast about how you you didn't really have a weekend this weekend because <laughs> the, the news just kept coming. It was, you know, the strike on Thursday and then, um, you know, the Trump's tweets over the weekend about targeting 52 sites, including cultural sites in Iran, um, Soleimani's uh, funeral and the demonstrations that have gone around with it. What are you looking at? What are you expecting in the next week that our listeners should be watching for? Well, a lot of things. Uh, a lot of it is not going to happen immediately, though. Uh, so to be clear, Iranian officials have said that they, that Iran will respond, but it will do so on its terms. So the time, the place, and the type of action it's going to take uh, remain to be seen. Uh, but here are a few things to watch for. One is what happens in Iraq. Uh, the Iraqi parliament voted or recommended for uh, the United States to withdraw its troops from there. That doesn't just affect us um, and our troops. It also affects uh, regional security more generally. The, the ISIS campaign and our allies and partners, 80 of them who have followed us and who have been working to push back ISIS. Uh, the second thing to watch for is all the domestic politics in Iran. We forget with everything happening, but Iran is going to have parliamentary elections in a few weeks. Oh, yeah, I did forget about that. <laughs> so um, Iran is going to have a lot going on. And this is all happening while people are coming out in millions, apparently, uh, to remember Soleimani. But more more importantly, to actually send the message to the United States uh, that they stand behind their leadership in the face of U.S. threats. To be clear, that doesn't mean that people are in love with the regime. It just means that they don't want a military conflict with the United States. And what does it mean for the region? Well, whatever happens is not going to be taking place in Iran or in the United States simply, right? It is going to have uh, effects in Iraq, in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, and potentially even Afghanistan. So the entire region is going to be standing on its toes and waiting to see what happens. And, you know, there is already humanitarian crises and catastrophes going on in Syria and Yemen, and any escalation that uh, sort of spills over uh, from the U.S.-Iran tensions is going to have deep, deep, a deep, deep impact. Thanks, Ariane. John Carl, switching gears, when we ended 2019, we thought North Korea would be the primary foreign policy or nuclear topic in the first couple months of the year. And clearly that has changed. But, you know, all of the world is watching what's going on. Um, does what happened over the weekend affect North Korea's calculus in working with the United States? I think it would have to. They know that Trump violated the Iran deal. So that's one deal that has uh, fallen by the wayside. That's one reason to be skeptical of him. And we also know that they don't like what they call decapitation raids, uh, which are a fairly provocative part of some U.S. and South Korean uh, military exercises where they actually practice 
taking out uh, a figure like Kim Jong-un. So when the United States actually does engage in the assassination of another foreign leader, they are, of course, going to uh, take note of that. So I think they're in something of a bind. They think that Trump is probably their best chance for a deal because he's rather unorthodox, to put it mildly. But at the same time, they know that he's untrustworthy and that he's erratic and that he could change his opinion at any moment and maybe even engage in violent action. So uh, they're in a bit of a bind. Any milestones we should be watching for? Well, we need to see what happens uh, with the military exercises in the spring. Secretary of Defense Esper has referenced that he may want to resume them. If that happens, the North will absolutely respond in some way. They won't be happy about it. Uh, so that, will, that should give us a bit more clarity about what this next year could be like. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye on it. John Carl, Ariane, thank you so much for joining. Always a pleasure. Thank you. I'm Joe Cirincioni, and I'm sitting down in the glass enclosed headquarters of Plowshares Fund in Washington, D.C., with Stephen Miles, executive director of Win Without War, and with Michelle Dover, our co host. That's right, we're doing things a little bit differently today. This is an urgent situation, so we wanted to bring you the latest on how bad the situation with Iran is. Are we going to war? Is there anything we can do to stop it, to mitigate it? What can you do, you who are listening to this? What can you do about this? And what's the mood here in Washington? So if you don't mind, we're going to jump right in. Yeah, Stephen, can we just start with how bad is it really? Sure. And thanks for thanks for having this conversation today. I think we can start with Quite simply, it's really, really bad. Uh, you know, I've been working on these issues for uh, going on nine years, and this is the closest that we've been to a direct military confrontation with Iran on a major scale. Um, you know, we've seen moments of tension before, we've seen moments of complication, but we are close to the brink of all out war between the United States and Iran. And there's really only one person to blame for that, and that's Donald Trump. Right. This is not something that Iran initiated, they didn't have plans to start a war with us. Correct. We, we've seen since day one of this administration, this president take one provocative escalatory measure after another, whether it was walking away from the JCPOA, which I know your listeners are well familiar with, uh, sending thousands of troops to the region, sending arms and unprecedented numbers to the region, filling his war, his cabinet with war hawks and folks like Mike Pompeo, who are amongst the most hawkish individuals around. They, this is a president who has taken step after step towards war with Iran. He got close this past summer and backed away in a very publicized moment that I think folks will remember. But the grounds for what we're seeing right now, every brick of that road was laid by this president over the last several years. Yeah, and I think some of our donors have um, argued with me that they don't think Trump wants to go to war with Iran. Right, that's, Michelle? No, that's exactly what I was going to bring up. I mean, I think that's a common refrain that we mm -hmm. hear that, you know, he campaigned to end the endless war. But as you laid out, there's plenty of evidence that he has actually done the exact opposite. Well, whether he planned this or not, I mean, yeah. I generally agree with our donors who say, no, he, he does not want to go to a war for basically the Tuck, uh, Tucker Carlson analysis, which is you go to war mm -hmm. with Iran, oil prices spike, the global economy tips into a recession, the stock market sinks, and so do your re-election chances. So don't go to war with Iran. That's what it's always been about with him. But what that analysis miscalculates is that there have been people like Pompeo who have wanted to go to war with Iran for years, for mm -hmm. decades. John Bolton, going back to 2003, you know, he told, when he was asked what the lesson of the Iraq invasion was for North Korea and Iran, he said, take a number. And that was the idea, right? And so these, this group of intentional go-to-war uh, advocates have now found sort of their, their ignorant, uninformed president who is stupid enough to actually do it. Yeah, I mean, look, in this town, there's it's, it's a disservice to call it a cottage industry. It's more like a mansion industry of people who <laughs> want a war with Iran. Yeah. Uh, and they've been working at it for a really long time, not just during the Bush administration, but ever since kind of painting this picture, putting the pieces in place, inching closer and closer and closer to this moment where a president would be boxed in. And regardless of his own intentions, regardless of his own desires, he'd have no choice but to go to conflict. When you combine that with the kind of utter recklessness that we see by Donald Trump, 
Trump, when you combine that with a president who clearly has no concern or understanding of the ramifications of his actions, I mean, look at the reporting we already have about how this decision was made in a matter of moments. You know, I think they're putting that out there as if it somehow indicates he's decisive and quick. What it indicates is that he didn't have any concern for what the consequences of his actions were. He didn't take the time to understand what might happen. And that's, that's you know, you might say that's quote unquote worked for him in the past, but there's been folks in other situations. Let's remember early in this administration when this president was talking about Ro Little Rocket Man and talking about nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula, he was bailed out by President Moon of South Korea who engaged and created a diplomatic off-ramp that the president can take. On Iran, there is no off-ramp because the president has surrounded by himself by people who've made it their job to go to war with Iran, who've made it their job to systematically dismantle and remove off-ramps to war. So whether that is not just dismantling the JCPOA, but eliminating the diplomatic contacts that we have that would be useful in a de-escalatory setting, ratcheting up sanctions that have given the have made the Iranians feel like they have no choice but to go into this sense of conflict, or just endlessly ratcheting up the pressure through arm sales, through troop deployments, through rhetoric. This president now is boxed into a corner. We have to hope and pray that someone somehow finds a way to de-escalate us out of this crisis, but I'm deeply, deeply concerned. And I'm also concerned by the way the administration apparatus is now couching the argument. I mean, I, overall, I would say they're winning the frame on cable news because the way that they have, have done this. And you wrote an excellent Twitter thread over the weekend comparing it to um, the, 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 the buildup to the war in Iraq. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of similarities uh, and, and there's there's all sorts of different different ways that, that there's parallels. Uh, there's the reality that we're hearing all sorts of conversations about uh, intelligence that's classified that we can't see it, but tells us everything was really bad. We just have to trust them. Uh, we know that that history there is not to be trusted. Right. And the, we've the, the cherry picking of intelligence. You can find intelligence on anything. Is it vetted? Do the intelligence <laughs> agencies all agree with this? That's mm -hmm. a whole different matter. Yeah. What, what you see that's the real concern, um, and, and we should be clear, and I'll talk in a second, there's ways this is deeply different than the situation with Iraq. Yeah, yeah, but, but what we should be concerned about is an administration that is intent on conflict, an intent on escalation, an intent on at least a rhetorical framework that boxes them in and creates no alternative pathway out. Uh, just, you know, I, I saw on Twitter a great, a great thread analyzing these similar uh, situations with Iraq and pointing out that Saddam Hussein tried to de-escalate. He got rid of his weapons of mass destruction. He tried to kind of appease the Americans in a way that might defuse the situation, but the momentum was there. The game was the game was played. The die was cast. The war was going to happen. Now, in this case, I think we might see a very different kind of war unfold. You know, I think there's some folks pushing back, saying, "Look, we're not going to see shock and awe. We're not going to see an invasion of of Iran." And, right. and people are being mm -hmm. hyperbolic. No one's necessarily saying that's going to happen, though that's a possibility, let's be clear. What's much more likely is a cycle of, of violence that escalates and escalates. And we have a very, very different conditions on the ground now than we did in 2003 with Iraq. We have a region that is on the brink and country after country, there is a fragile, fragile peace. And one spark could ignite a fire in any of those countries in a way that is very unpredictable, but could ultimately lead not just to a conflict conflict escalation between Iran and the United States, but we have to be really clear, it could lead to massive loss of life, massive human suffering, and all in the guise of trying to fight a war that we already know at the outset cannot possibly be won. Well, and I think I want to pause on that real quick to highlight, we're talking about a war, the loss of life we're talking about is in the Middle East, primarily. It will involve American lives. But, you know, talking about the scale, I think it's sometimes hard to bring home to the U.S. just what it, you know, we have our comfy blanket of two oceans and friendly neighbors. Um, knowing how many people could die is is really unsettling and horrifying. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that has to leave us concerned. You know, it's not the political leaders in Washington, D.C. or Tehran that are going to bear the brunt of this of this conflict. It is 
people, people on the ground, the men and women in uniform for the United States. You know, just yesterday I heard from a friend uh, who had a family member that they found out just got deployed as part of this contingent. They're deeply terrified. They're deeply worried. The pain and and the fear is already beginning to permeate. Um, we, we were talking earlier, uh, the concern about uh, uh, the draft here in the United States and selective service, the selective service website crashed. That's indicative of the fear that's out there from people. But nonetheless, we know that the real impact will be for folks on the ground, the, the Iraqis, the Iranians, people who have been suffering immensely with the consequences of our foreign policy and the consequences of conflict. The, the threat for them is, is real. So what do you think people can do right now, whether you're a member of Congress or you're um, a, a citizen out there in Colorado or Kansas or California? What can we do right now? And, and tell us a little bit about what Win Without War is, what exactly your organization does, and the kinds of things you're encouraging people to do. Yeah, th thanks, Joe. And Win Without War is uh, an organization that actually came into existence in the run-up to the Iraq War. It was a coming together of a number of organizations who were concerned about the devastation that that war would do and the consequences that we unfortunately saw come to bear when that war eventually started in 2003. That understanding is still, I think, what's motivating uh, organizations all across this country to be active right now. You know, we have since Thursday been in contact with dozens of organizations. But more importantly, I think you're seeing a level of energy, a level of mobilizing that's coming to fruition because the American people are are energized. This isn't the kind of issue where we have to persuade the American public, mm -hmm. where the American public is on our side. Overwhelmingly, a majority of Americans are opposed to conflict with Iran. They do not want this war. In poll after poll after poll, people understand that it's this president and his actions that have gotten us to this point, and they want to see them stopped. Everyone is on the side of opposing a stupid war that has no business being fought. The thing that's missing, the thing that's broken, is the function is a functioning government. It's our democracy that's broken. So first and foremost, what we need is members of Congress to listen to their constituents, to listen to the American public, and then we need them to reclaim their power. You know, the founders of this country put the power to go to war firmly in Congress's hands yes. because they wanted it to be close to the people, because they wanted the wisdom of the American public to decide whether or not we went to war. And importantly, because they didn't want one man deciding whether or not we go to war. They knew what it was like to live with kings and queens deciding whether or not you go to war. They knew what it was like to put that kind of power in one individual's hands. And they were vehemently opposed to it. So they gave it to Congress, not because it would be easy, but precisely because it would be hard. And they said, if you cannot get a majority of Congress to decide that we should go to war, then we have no business sending young men and women off to die in it. So do you think then that, uh, you know, you, you talked about the 2003 war as being, the die was cast. Do you think the die is cast in this case? Or are there steps that people can take? to actually prevent that from happening. I, I don't think the die is cast. I think that people do have a chance to still make their voice heard. We have, we are likely to see action by Congress as early as this week. We are seeing people take to the streets all across this country, picking up the phone and calling their members of Congress, making their voices heard. We need to see a lot more of that. Folks can certainly go to our website, winwithoutwar.org, as well as other websites and find out more about how they can take action. Uh, we're likely to launch a website, nowarwithiran.org, in the, in the next couple hours. So there should be more information there about how folks can take action. But no, the die is not cast. The odds are stacked against us. Let's be clear. The reality is, is that there is a lot of different ways that this gets much worse before it gets better. But the one thing that can change the course of events is if we can demonstrate that the American public is opposed to this, we can hopefully then change this president's thinking and his calculus. So how do we demonstrate that? We need to make it public. We need to be in the streets. We need to make our voices heard through Congress so that Congress you know, gets off of its backside and gets into this fight. Congress has willingly given up that power. Yeah, so it, uh, is there opportunities for Congress to act this week or next week? Yes, uh, Speaker Pelosi has announced that the House of Representatives is likely to vote as early as this week on legislation to do, to block the president's path to war with Iran. And who's this, introducing that legislation? Uh, this is likely to be introduced by Representative Slotkin uh, in the House, Senator Kane in the Senate. Has so if people supported that legislation, they should? They should pick up the phone, call their member of Congress, 
Uh, they can email their member of Congress any way they make their voice heard. They Members of Congress love being on Twitter. If you have Twitter, get on Twitter, include your member of Congress, tell them they need to stop war with Iran. They need to do everything in their power. So this is uh, Representative Slotkins and one of the newly elected so-called National Security Democrats, right? Yes, yeah, so and we expect other legislation as right, well. Right, there's also yeah. Ro Khanna, yeah. one of the leaders of the Progressive Caucus. What's he doing? Yeah, earlier this year, Ro Khanna and a number of other members of Congress in a bipartisan way envisioned just this concern. They passed legislation as part of the NDAA with a bipartisan vote, more than two dozen Republicans in the House voting along with them. It had 50 votes uh, in the Senate, and there was only 90 votes that day, so it was a majority, but again, bipartisan majority. The Republicans in Congress and the White House were adamant that they not include that legislation, so it's not in the final NDAA. That legislation, importantly, would have barred the use of funds. Just let me ask you that. I mean, that <laughs> looking back on this, this yeah. is one of the top priorities we had for the NDAA. Yeah. It did not include it. Did Congress blow it there? Did the leadership not understand the importance of doing this because they believed Trump would never be as stupid as he's been. Mitch McConnell on the floor debate for this legislation said there was no need for it because Donald Trump has been clear he doesn't want a war with Iran and he would never go to war with Iran. And so did the Democrats buy that? The Democrats, I, I don't know what was in their heads, but they, di they, they didn't ensure that whether or not Mitch McConnell was lying, and he clearly was, that they had blocked this path. So one lesson is we missed our chance. We had a chance back there to block exactly what's transpiring now. This legislation would have prohibited funds for... For going to war. <sighs> so now... There, there's a good lesson in there, you know? Yeah, yeah. If, if you want to block someone from doing something and they fight you and they say, no, no, don't block me from doing that, it's probably because they want to do that thing you're trying yeah, to block yeah, them yeah, from. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, in the future, we need to fight even harder for these kinds of things. And we need to not take anyone at their word. If we don't want to have a war with Iran, we need to use every tool in the toolkit. So to who are the them. leaders in the Congress right now who are doing this? You said Ro Khanna, you said uh, Representative Slotkin. I think uh, Bernie Sanders is also introducing legislation. Tim Kaine, Tom Udall in the Senate, others? Yeah, representatives uh, Ilhan Omar and Barbara Lee as well are taking leadership on this. There's a whole host of folks who are, who are coming into the fray on this. And one of the things happening right now as Congress comes back from their recess uh, break is they're figuring out exactly what that legislative pathway looks like. And we'll have more clarity in the next couple hours. But when you see see members of Congress tripping over one another to get out in front of this, it's because they understand where the American public is. They understand that people are opposed to this and they want to be leading that parade. It's our job to make that parade as big as we possibly can, because the only way we're going to stop this war is if everybody goes all in. So you said calls, you said petitions, you said emails, you said take to the streets. If I am someone out in the middle of the country somewhere. How do I find out if demonstrations are happening? Sure. Well, like I said, you can always come to our website, winwithoutwar.org. You can also check out nowarwithiran.org. But in the coming days, I expect that we're going to see the kind of energy. We saw protests all over the country this weekend organized by Code Pink and others. We saw uh, Code Pink Nyack and others. We saw a real... Uh, energy. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the coming days. One of the things that we do know as well, uh, the Women's March, a, a group of folks who came together after the election of Donald Trump, they have nationwide mobilization scheduled for later this month on January 18th. We can be sure that this is likely to be uh, an, a, an item talked about uh, at an event as part of those events. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities. Keep an eye out. I always say whichever group it is you want to be a part of, whoever you <laughs> like to get your emails from, that's fine. But when they come into your inbox, open them up, read them, listen. There's a lot of great folks out there who are working on this. We're all going to be in this together because we need all of us. To How about the war. big national groups, moveon.org, Indivisible? What are they doing? They're very involved in all these things. We've been speaking with one another on a kind of constant basis. We're, we're in conversations right now about what the next steps are. And I think you're going to hear a lot of uh, a lot more from them in the future. I should say moveon.org has already announced that they have a nationwide call that they're co-hosting with us on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern for activists to find out more ways that they can get involved. So we're going, to, there's going to be a lot of ways that folks can get involved. But the question is not going to be kind of if there's a way to get involved. It's going to be whether or not people get involved. You know, these kinds of wars depend on one thing, really, and that's people sitting this fight out. 
That's people staying at home, not letting it happen, thinking that foreign policy is something that somebody in Washington who's smarter than them decides. One thing we can all be clear of, particularly sitting here in Washington, there's a lot of dumb people in this town. Foreign policy is not a spectator sport. We need people involved. We need them to make their voices heard. And if they want to avoid a war, if they want to say no war with Iran, they need to stand up. They need to take to the streets. They need to call Congress. Any way that they make their voice heard, now is the time for action. How bad do you think this could get? I think it could get real bad. I think we're likely, you know, the Iranians have already announced they're going to do something in response. Um, I, I hope they will not do that. I hope that they will choose a different path. I hope that someone, uh, in, whether it's the Europeans, the Chinese, the Russians, someone is able to have a diplomatic intervention. I hope that Donald Trump wakes up and has a change of heart and decides he wants to get off this path to war. But if he doesn't, this can get bad quickly. And it has the chance not to just be a big uh, a kind of a big action or something. This has the chance to, you know, I, I know I, this might this might trigger you a little, Joe, but this has a chance to be a real domino theory of, yeah. of situation. Yeah. This has a chance where one spark might cause a conflagration that that gets really bad really fast. And the truth is, I don't know what's going to happen, but nobody else knows what's going to happen either. Yeah. And that's actually what's the most terrifying thing. One last question I have, and then Michelle, if there's any that you have, how do you think the media has dealt with this so far? I think the media has done uh, a pretty poor job, and I think it's just pretty often the case with them. Um, whether that is kind of having hawkish voices on who aren't disclosing that they're actually being paid by arms makers and or foreign governments to talk about these issues. Do you want, I think I'm thinking about the same person you are, the former Secretary of, of Homeland Security. Uh, Johnson. I was thinking about Jay Johnson was Jay on. Johnson yeah, was on. He, was on he was on Meet the Press. They never disclosed that he gets three hundred and ten thousand dollars from Lockheed Martin, yeah. whose stock prices jumped yeah. on Friday while the rest of the market was sinking. Arms makers make money off of war, so war is good for them. And they have people on TV who are in the pay of yeah. defense contractors. No disclosure. That is disgusting. It's disgraceful. Meet the press. Change your standards. I think that's right. You know, when we think back to the Iraq war, we think back to the run up. The failure of the media was one of the great causes of that war. The failure to question what they were being told by the administration, the failure to question the motivations of who they were putting on the air, and the failure to not put on the air people who were objectively wrong about the thing they were talking about. You know, when this news broke, Fox News had on Carl Rove and Ari Fleischer to talk yeah. about this. I cannot think of two people less qualified to talk about what we should be doing militarily in Iraq than Carl Rove and, and Ari Fleischer, except for maybe Dick Cheney, who uh, probably wasn't available. I saw very few genuine anti-war voices. I mean, nobody from the organizations we've talked about is if what, they don't matter? What, they, they're, 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 they're not a part of the Washington establishment, so we can't have them on? Yeah, I mean, it, look, it's really frustrating. The, the simple fact is there are people who have gotten this wrong time and time and time again. We need to stop listening to them. And those of us who have been out there saying there will be devastating consequences for the Iraq war, those of us who have been out there warning about the escalatory path this president has been on, we're the ones that need, that, that need to be having a bigger microphone in this moment. We are speaking not just because we have these ideas and, and we're kind of getting paid to say them. We're speaking because the American public has our backs, because we are speaking from having watched this game play out before. This is a moment to listen to different voices. This is a moment to be elevating voices from the region, Iraqi, Iranian voices, people on the ground who are likely to be the victims of this war. This is the time to listen to them, not former generals, former administration officials sitting in cushy offices here in Washington, D.C., collecting massive paychecks from the arms industry. Those are not the folks to listen to about whether or not our country goes to war. So final thoughts on this. I mean, the news came at us fast and furious since Thursday. It mm -hmm. seems like every couple hours there has been another story, whether it's, you know, how this the initial killing actually happened, who had a say, whether or not there's a plan, spoiler alert, no plan. Um, what will you be looking for in the coming week to understand this trajectory? That's a great question. I mean, I think we're gonna have to look to events on the ground. Uh, the region is volatile. We can't predict what 
what is going to happen. Um, there's a lot of folks uh, who are making calculations now and, and have decision making power who who are going to take action and we're going to have to wait and see what happens, um, whether that's uh, the Iraqi government deciding whether or not uh, to follow through with their desire to kick out American troops, whether that's the Iranians and their response or whether that's uh, the U.S. and Donald Trump and his decisions. We're going to have to wait and see what happens. Um, but one thing is for sure. I am going to be looking and listening to the voices of the American public and the voices from the region who are begging, pleading, and doing everything they can to ask us here in Washington to stop this war. They're being unequivocal, and our job is to listen to them. Stephen, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us. Thank you for seizing the moment and for seizing the mic. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Sender, Alex Spire, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Research by Alex Spire. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.